All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us again for this week's session of the Monsoon Seminar Series. Today, we are joined by Professor Anoke Gupta um, from the Indian Institute of Technology in Karakpur. And so without further ado, um, the housekeeping rules are as usual. Um, we, have, uh, we, we would like you to type your questions into the chat so that at the end um, of Dr. Gupta's talk, we can kind of uh, call on you to either read out your question or we will just um, go ahead and read your question for you. Um, and uh, please remember if you want to receive announcements or like uh, copies of the video recordings um, through the cloud, uh, just send myself an email or one of the other hosts an email uh, who are uh, Peter Clift or the Lee Joseon. So again, uh, welcome. And uh, we'll let uh, Dr. Gupta uh, tell us a little bit about the monsoon and South Asian societies. So thank you. Thank you, Dara. And uh, I thank Peter for inviting me to uh, deliver a talk in this monsoon series, <clears throat> which is a topic of uh, my research, current research interests. So I'm going to speak on monsoon variability and its impact on South Asian societies <clears throat> during the late quaternary uh, time slice, which is in fact of uh, societal relevance. So if you look at uh, this uh, climate timeline, the uh, momentum, early momentum to climate research was given by uh, mainly by physicists and mathematicians. And it was Joseph Fourier who actually discovered the greenhouse effect. And um, he uh, actually analyzed the uh, effect of uh, these uh, greenhouse gases in, uh, um, in glass greenhouses. And his research was carried on by Tyndall and Arrhenius. But uh, geologists came into a uh, fray only uh, with uh, James Hutton's uh, hypothesis or uh, principle of uh, uniformitarianism, which he where he found uh, glacier deposits in areas uh, th there is no glaciation at present, or there are no glaciers in present. And uh, uh, but systematic study by geologists to understand past climate variability um, was uh, initiated by uh, uh, Caesar Emiliani, who worked with uh, Harold Ure, and he systematically analyzed the stable isotopes in carbonate shells of uh, foraminifera and. Uh, um, uh, you know, try to reconstruct the history of past climate. And of course, we have numerous other organizations which are involved in understanding the weather and climate variability across the world. Now, this is Cleaver um, map, which uh, has 13 hot spots or uh, switch and choke points, and monsoon is one of them, in fact. Uh, it has both regional as well as global impact on, uh, on climate <clears throat> and uh, uh, being uh, uh, you know, a system that drives economy of a very densely populated region of uh, Asia, uh, this is of uh, uh, greater interest to uh, the uh, monsoon workers. Now, um, if uh, you look at uh, the uh, past climate uh, variability, there are uh, both marine proxies as well as continental proxies. And uh, this seminar uh, series has uh, several presentations by both uh, marine as well as continental workers. And uh, among marine deposits, the uh, ocean drilling program has played very vital role. In fact, it has provided uh, one of the best uh, undisturbed sediment cores to climate uh, workers uh, where they, uh, they have uh, sliced cores at uh, intervals of their interest, producing some of the best records from all across the world. And uh, among marine proxies, foraminifera, both planktic as well as banktic have been analyzed uh, in uh, more detail as compared to other um, um, you know, proxies uh, from the marine uh, sediments. And uh, Globigerina boulogardis, for example, has been used as an upwelling indicator and Globotalia minardii uh, as an um, as a thermocline species, and also um, we have also used banthic foraminifera uh, to learn about the uh, the um, uh, nutrient fluxes as well as oxygen levels of the deeper sea. <clears throat> Whereas 
in marine sedi uh, marine record we have um, uh, some of the best um, sediment cores provided by ocean drilling program on land we have spilothem uh, which have been uh, uh, analyzed and uh, producing some of the best records of uh, climate variability in the past both from china as well as uh, india uh, lakes are also quite sensitive uh, to uh, climate variability and uh, uh, we have recently initiated a major program on lake studies. So isotopic and element ratios, as well as uh, size, uh, grain size uh, for energy models have been used in uh, uh, retrieving information of uh, uh, climate response of lake during the past uh, few thousand years. And of course, we have ice cores and tree rings, which are also um, being used in um, uh, understanding the, um, the, the past climate. Some of the best uh, high resolution records of uh, climate have come from the polar regions. In fact, it was the North Atlantic and uh, Greenland uh, ice that has uh, that have provided uh, the uh, the uh, best ice cores. In fact, and uh, we have uh, gone uh, to generate a record of uh, changes in the northern pole uh, up to um, uh, 120,000 or 200,000 years, and then later on from Vostok and uh, southern pole. From tropics, uh, the, uh, we have uh, good data from uh, 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 some of the ice cores from Tibet, like Gulia, Dunde, and Dasapo. And of course, uh, Spilothem and lake records from China and India have also been uh, analyzed, and we have uh, produced some of the best uh, uh, high resolution records of uh, climate variability. So these are uh, some of the uh, records which have been. Uh, used as a uh, as model to uh, you know understand the um, uh, the uh, climate variability in other parts of the world and uh, major late quaternary uh, climatic events which are of great interest to climate workers uh, are uh, like heinrich events uh, dansgaard oyster ice cycles bond events all have been reported from the atlantic and then we have uh, last glacial maximum Younger Dryas, early Holocene climatic optimum, 4.2 K event, then Roman warm period, medieval climate anomaly, as well as the uh, Little Ice Age. So all these events have been of great uh, interest to uh, the climate workers because of their um, you know, impact on human societies <clears throat> all across the world. When we analyze any proxy record, the dating is very important. In fact, in order to uh, properly put these events in chronological order. It is necessary to have uh, good dates, in fact. And uh, uh, for uh, uh, for carbonate, we or for charcoal, we use the MSC fourteen dating. Whereas for spilotheins, we have used uranium thorium uh, series dating. Of course, we uh, high scores have uh, layer counting, and warps also have warp counting. Uh, so with that background, we come to the tropics. In fact, tropics uh, are marked by a very uh, you know, important uh, monsoon system, which includes African, Indian, or, or South Asian, as well as East Asian monsoon system. And we have Aust Australasian, which also impact a, a, a small region, which includes northern part of Australia and uh, Indonesian region. <clears throat> and this is the reason, which is uh, also known as Green Pool, where it houses uh, major source of moisture, major river system, forest. And this is also the uh, most densely populated region in the world. So this is the reason where, where uh, the climate workers have focused to understand how the climate has behaved and how human societies have evolved with time. So our focus is on the South Asian monsoon system or Indian monsoon system, as we all know. The Indian monsoon is marked by... The problem uh, I'm sorry, there is a background noise. The uh, Indian monsoon system is, uh, is marked by the, the, the seasonal reversals in wind direction. In the summertime, we have uh, southwest uh, monsoon winds, which carry moisture from the Arabian Sea and uh, Bengal drop over the uh, Indian land mass. And as the uh, monsoon intensifies, it, it, it follows the uh, ITCZ which is pushed to the north in the, um, in, during the summertime. 
and during winter time the uh, winds uh, reverse uh, from uh, northeast to southwest and also the uh, intertropical convergence zone is pushed to the south of the equator now it is not only the change in the wind direction but also the uh, surface ocean response to the change in wind direction so surface currents also uh, move accordingly <clears throat> so we have uh, the different ocean current patterns uh, in the two seasons and these ocean currents are more stronger during the southwest monsoon season now why the uh, south asian monsoon is so important in fact uh, it is so important because of the socio economic importance is um, it controls water budget of asia uh, it uh, you know impacts the vegetation including agricultural practices the ecosystem ocean chemistry that affects the global uh, carbon dioxide budget and of course the uh, economic well being of uh, the region which is uh, which uh, has almost two third of the world's human population now monsoon or monsoon rains are important to the people of india since ancient times and this is a shloka in sanskrit from valmiki ramayana which was written in sanskrit and uh, its english trans translation is for 9 months the sky drank the ocean's water sucking it up through the sun's rays and now gives birth to a liquid of a spring that is the elixir of life so this was said by lord ram explaining the rainy season in the kishkinda kand of valmiki ramayana uh, even uh, there are other indian texts that mention about the, uh, the structures which uh, have uh, some relevance to monsoon rainfall for example in rigveda we have description of ponds how to collect water during the rainy season and then as late as uh, during the um, you know 1200 ad around what rise tarangi in the describes uh, lakes tanks and water management in <clears throat> the northern part of india so monsoon has been lifeline to the people of indian subcontinent in fact the all the uh, great dynasties in india right uh, which are now part of afghanistan and pakistan all these dynasties flourished in fact along major perennial river systems uh, which were mainly fed by the monsoon precipitation <clears throat> um, so uh, it is lifeline it has been lifeline to the people of india it is the lifeline to the people of south asia and uh, as you can see from this figure an intense monsoon Uh, may cause widespread floods in different parts of south asia including india and bangladesh and you can see thousands are rendered homeless during this time but if you look at the other phase of monsoon um uh, if the monsoon fails then the people rush to fetch even a drop of water the uh, uh, for for drinking purpose the there is no water for irrigation and the animals die out so <clears throat> these uh, drops and uh, intense or extreme events of monsoon rainfall have occurred in the past uh, and also they have occurred during the last 100 years and one of the victims of uh, this drought has been river saraswati this is the course we have uh, done some work in this uh, the channel of river saraswati we found uh, a very uh, almost abundant course by this river and uh, on the basis of osl dates we found the river probably dried up around 3000 years ago <clears throat> um still we see that the monsoon and uh, human um, you know intervention are playing havoc to uh, the uh, to the river systems you can see such a beautiful river in kolkata it is adi ganga uh, the pictures were clicked in 1860 65 1880 can see sufficient water in this river and this is the current picture current scenario of the same river same place it is full of uh, you know um, garbage uh, there is no water and the river channel has dried up so the monsoon uh, decrease as well as the uh, uh, human intervention human interference in the natural systems are uh, leading to such a scenario <clears throat> of river network in india the uh, modern day monsoon research uh, in india began following the great famines of uh, 1866 and 
which uh, during which time uh, Bengal suffered maximum in fact, and uh, British government at that time decided to establish India Meteorological Department in 1875, and made Sir John Elliot as its first Director General of Observations and H.F. Uh, Blandford as Meteorological Reporter. But before that, we have, as I uh, showed earlier, there are certain ancient texts where the, uh, the, the, these uh, people have described the movement of clouds and behavior of monsoon uh, in, our, uh, in the past. So according to Blenford, the uh, who actually uh, first, for the first time suggested following the drought, uh, following the famine in 1877, he suggested that the uh, Himalayan snow probably um, uh, impacts the monsoon strength uh, from season to season. And he suggested thicker the snow, weaker is the monsoon in the following season. And uh, thinner is the snow, stronger is the monsoon in the following season. So this is how the monsoon research began um, uh, by the Indian Meteorological Department, uh, 1878 onwards. But if you look on geological time scale, uh, Himalayan heights, in fact, play the major role. These act as barriers to uh, stop the uh, effect of midwesterlies, and uh, that is how the monsoon trough moves northwestward. And the, it is also believed that the uh, closing of the Indonesian seaway probably brought changes in monsoon seasonality uh, following its closure in the early Pliocene time. So we have both uh, seasonal, annual, and uh, multi-annual, centennial scales, millennial scale, as well as um, um, geological uh, changes in the uh, monsoon and climate uh, behavior. <clears throat> now the um, abrupt changes in um, the climate were first, as I said earlier, studied in the North Atlantic, which are um, uh, known as Dansgar Oyster Cycles um, and Heinrich events. And uh, scientists uh, began to find uh, these abrupt changes in the tropics. And it was the, in the Hulu Cave and Dong Caves that, uh, 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 that we uh, see the same similar type of uh, repeated occurrences of ups and downs in the, um, in the, um, uh, in the monsoon precipitation. And, uh, if you look at these curves uh, from the uh, continent, from the Oman margin, from Pakistan margin, there is an, uh, there is an alignment between the uh, North Atlantic and the tropical uh, record. So this shows that there is a teleconnectivity between the uh, two records and the presence of these uh, millennial scale or centennial scale events uh, are not only found in the uh, North Atlantic, but also in the tropics. We have uh, found similar events, uh, uh, which are called as bond events in the uh, Holocene time. Uh, the uh, cold intervals of the North Atlantic, which are known as bond events, uh, have their counterparts in the uh, monsoon uh, weakening, the, the, the weakening of the monsoon winds, in fact. So we see the repeated occurrences of these weak monsoon wind intervals during the Holocene time. So it is not uh, the people thought that monsoon, the Holocene interval probably was more stable as compared to the older intervals, but that is not true. During the Holocene time, we see such repeated occurrences of abrupt events. <clears throat> this is uh, the data from the Oman margin, again, the last thousand years. And we see uh, a mild increase during the medieval climate anomaly uh, in, in the uh, monsoon wind strength, which is also the time when the precipitation was uh, higher. And over the last 400 years, we see that the wind monsoon, southwest monsoon wind uh, have intensified, uh, except in, uh, you know, during the Maunder minimum and uh, during, the, uh, 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 during the 19th century uh, event. Um, when we come to the land, uh, as I said, the, uh, uh, the um, spilothemes uh, provide some of the best records of uh, climate variability uh, and in, in South Asia, the monsoon variability. The uh, delta O18 ratio in spilothems uh, is a function of uh, uh, transport pathways as well as source effects. So how far is the uh, source and what is the isotopic composition of the source surface water? And uh, this is the uh, 
backtracking of wind trajectory, you can see that during monsoon season, the uh, source is mainly the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal uh, in the uh, northeast uh, Himalayan state of Meghalaya. Um, this is another uh, backtracking of wind trajectories in the Sahya Cave, which is in Uttarakhand, uh, central Himalaya, or I would say northwest Himalaya. Uh, but here the source is uh, not only the Arabian Sea, but also from the central uh, Asian region, in fact. So uh, the source is very important, in fact, to explain the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the isotope ratio in spolithiums. Now, in 2014, we initiated a, uh, uh, from marine to continent, we initiated a new research program on spilothems. And this is the longest record of spilotheme from Meghalaya, from Mamlu Cave, which we produced, uh, that we, uh, we took it back to 33,000 years. Uh, one can see uh, younger dryas um, has come out very nicely, uh, uh, and then we have Heinrich event one, but uh, we do not see the uh, the, the uh, LGM. Uh, we thought that during this time, the monsoon must have been uh, very weak, which is not true in fact. <clears throat> and then we have uh, the higher precipitation during the early Holocene uh, climatic uh, optimum. Uh, when we uh, you know, overlap the uh, solar insulation, we found a good correlation between the uh, Mamlu cave record and the uh, uh, solar variability or sun activity. Uh, in uh, later uh, this year, we have uh, taken the uh, Mamlu cave record back in time to 45,000 years, and uh, uh, we have uh, found all the uh, four Heinrich events, one, two, three, four. Um, in uh, among all these four events, you can see that Heinrich event three is not as uh, is strong as one, two, and four. And this we have linked to the uh, source uh, and distance of the source. Uh, Heinrich event three is of uh, European origin, whereas one, two, and four are of Laurentide origin. So farther the source, we have more negative uh, delta 18 values and uh, nearer or proximal is the source, we have less negative delta 18 value. <clears throat> this is uh, another record from an adjacent cave, uh, Oms Umsing Rang from Meghalaya. Um, the, uh, we thought the record will uh, come out very nicely, but uh, the younger dryas, uh, though we have uh, uh, the presence of younger dryas in our record, but it is not very uh, neat, I would say. Um, this is the last thousand year record from the Vashkar cave from the Northeast, uh, um, Northeast uh, Himalaya, that is Meghalaya. And uh, we uh, could see two, uh, you know, major events uh, which we have related to uh, uh, flood events during the medieval climate anomaly. And uh, during the Little Ice Age, what we see that the trend is more secular. In fact, we do not see such abrupt, uh, you know, changes in the uh, precipitation. And following the 17th century, we see the changes are quite. Uh, uh, abrupt, in fact, and these downward arrows are uh, um, are drought events which have been uh, recorded in IMD archives, uh, and uh, uh, most of these events are uh, aligned with what what has been what have been reported in the IMD archives. Uh, in 2016, we moved to uh, another proxy um, uh, that is lake, and uh, our first uh, study was in. Uh, Ladakh region, that is Somorari uh, Lake, where we found a, uh, uh, you know, the well-known 4.2 K event. We uh, could see that the um, the arid phase began around uh, 4,350 years ago, and that continued quite longer, in fact, as compared to the uh, plains or uh, the Ganga Basin. Uh, we also have uh, analyzed record, lake record from the Ganga Basin. This is a, um, this is the site uh, or record from Lilog Lake, which is very close to Ahichhatra. Ahichhatra is, is an archaeological site, <clears throat> which is a Mahavarat, uh, you know, lake. And uh, unfortunately, we, uh, we uh, lost the top 3,000 years record because the uh, government of that state of Uttar Pradesh 
remove the top layer for uh, developmental activity. So we could see only the record, which is older than 3000 years. Um, and then there were some problems with the uh, coring. Uh, we found some mixing in the older interval, but uh, in the younger interval, which is rich in clay, we found uh, the uh, presence of 4.2K event. This uh, we believe lasted for a few decades in fact. And then following this 4.2K event, uh, we see a more moist uh, phase. And uh, on the basis of uh, the isotope values, delta Z13 of the uh, organic matter, we, uh, we, we could uh, uh, tell that the uh, uh, human activity probably uh, was rampant around 3,700 years or maybe a little more than that. And uh, it, uh, the agricultural practices uh, uh, began to dominate, which were uh, like camp plants, uh, mainly the winter crops in the Ganga Basin from this time onward, from 3,700, 3,800 years onwards. <clears throat> uh, this is another uh, lake record from Himachal, uh, Revolser Lake. And uh, in this uh, lake, we uh, find a very uh, uh, you know, presents a very nice uh, event during the Roman Vaughan period. Um, the, you know, the monsoon was quite intense, and this is also uh, believed to be the uh, the uh, uh, duration when India's economy was probably at its peak. In fact, this began at around 600 BC and lasted up until 500 AD. In fact, but during uh, MCA or medieval climate anomaly, we see a moderate change in monsoon precipitation. And then we see from 1600 AD onwards, uh, greater precipitation. In fact, this is almost similar to what we have seen in the marine record, the, a change in uh, wind strength in fact, the more stronger Southwest monsoon winds during the last 400 years. <clears throat> So as a, um, you know, as a climate worker and uh, to tell something to the history people and uh, to social scientists, we, uh, um, you know, super, superimpose these historical records on our uh, uh, monsoon record of precipitation record from the uh, Varshikar Lake, Varshikar Cave from Meghalaya. And uh, after examining all the historical events, we found that it was not climate actually that was responsible for the demise or fall of these dynasties in India. In fact, there were more than that. Uh, mostly, we believe these were related to social uh, upheavals or social discontent um, uh, that actually led to uh, such dynasties and uh, invasions from outside uh, uh, powers. <clears throat> So um, the main highlights uh, of what we have uh, done in uh, lakes in um, in uh, in, uh, in Spilotheim and uh, in marine uh, records, uh, we we have classified to different time slices. So during post inner dry as to early Holocene climatic optima, we see increased summer precipitation and uh, evidence of rise at Lahora Deva. Lahora Deva is. Uh, uh, is located in the eastern part of Uttar Pradesh in the Ganga Basin. And uh, there are uh, reports of rice uh, in this uh, Lahora Deva, at, which are dated at 12,000 years ago. So humans were uh, growing um, rice. This probably could be the wild variety of rice, but the, 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 there was a presence of humans and the cultivation in Lahora Deva. Then around 9,000 years BC, we see the evidence of domestication of both plants and animals in the Indian subcontinent. And uh, the wheat uh, probably began as the monsoon began to weaken, wheat uh, uh, was cultivated by the you know, farmers along with uh, uh, rice, barley, jujube, and other, uh, you know, and these are all domesticated around that time. <clears throat> And uh, late Holocene time, we see more expansion of wheat and barley farming. These are winter crops in the western part of India and also the Ganga Basin. Um, during the uh, 4.2K event, we see uh, a, which is a major phase, in fact, uh, has been reported by numerous workers. Not only uh, we have reported, but also earlier workers. Uh, and uh, here we see lots of uh, displacements, migrations of population from west to east and north to south. 
And this uh, arid phase uh, led to appearance of numerous freshwater lakes in, in the Ganga Basin. In fact, we have seen several lakes which um, began to develop around that time. And uh, there was also a shift towards pastoralism, that is expansion of uh, place life uh, uh, around that time. Uh, also, there was increased human activity and agricultural practices in the Ganga Basin, which were dominated by uh, camp plants. <clears throat> then we see um, the first millennium, uh, uh, ex uh, intense monsoon expansion of rice cultivation in the Ganga Basin. During the uh, medieval climate anomaly, uh, we have wet monsoon um, marked by uh, a few uh, flood events, which were quite uh, pronounced, in fact. The Little Ice Age, we see a secular trend in the monsoon and uh, probably the uh, lower precipitation. And uh, last millennium, we see a uh, recurring of uh, uh, drought and flood events, especially during the last 400 years, in fact. So uh, I looked at some of the archaeological sites, in fact, which have been uh, published by Elchin and Elchin. <clears throat> And I plotted these uh, archaeological sites on a map uh, with river systems. I found most of these sites, archaeological sites, uh, which show presence of humans, in fact, are located in the northwestern part of Indian subcontinent, now you know, parts of Pakistan and Afghanistan. So we began our journey in uh, Bolan Valley, that is in Meher, Mehergarh in Bolan Valley. And from there, people uh, migrated to the north and to the east, in fact. Uh, this happened in the early Holocene time, that is around 9,000 to 7,000 years ago. And as the monsoon began to weaken, in fact, in, uh, um, you know, uh, we see the expansion of these uh, or uh, movement of these archaeological sites to the east in the Ganga Basin, in fact, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, these archaeological sites began to appear uh, since 5,000 years ago. This is Ahichatra, in fact, where we have... Uh, uh, our uh, lake record. <clears throat> so most of these sites expanded to the east. So that means as the monsoon began to weaken, there was less precipitation, less water uh, supply in the northwestern part as compared to the eastern parts. Whenever the, the monsoon is weak, the east always receives more rains, in fact, as compared to the western and northwestern part of uh, India. So uh, the, the, uh, the monsoon played very important role in uh, the shifting of the population and also the, uh, their uh, agricultural practices with time. And as this arid phase began, uh, we, uh, as I said earlier, River Saraswati uh, disappeared. In fact, it dried up. This is a, an abundant uh, channel of River Saraswati where we did some work and uh, it is believed that this river probably dried up at, at around 3000 years ago on the basis of coastal dates. Uh, we have also done some uh, exercise as the uh, monsoon, uh, uh, you know, behavior changed with time. You, you have both uh, 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 wet and arid phases in the monsoon and how the uh, rainwater harvesting structures have developed in uh, uh, different parts of India, especially in uh, central India and in western India. So we have, uh, you know, made some schematic, um, you know, this is our imagination that this is how the rainwater harvesting structures appeared 2000 BC and around 1000 BC it, uh, it was like this, uh, 50 BC around this and then uh, uh, in the uh, 950 AD was around because the aridity, uh, the monsoon began to weaken in fact um, around that time. <clears throat> so uh, we have identified more lakes, in fact, in uh, parts of uh, Eastern India and in parts of West Bengal and uh, Odisha and, um, you know, in, in Northern India also. And uh, we are uh, going to work on these lake sediments to, uh, uh, to retrieve more information about the changes uh, in monsoon in the Eastern part of India, because Eastern part of India has not been examined much as compared to the uh, other sectors of the Ganga Basin, in fact. So uh, that is what I will end with this uh, figure um, uh, where, Lord, where Samrat Ashoka or King Ashoka says, I will change. Uh, I will no longer be known as the evil Ashoka, but as Ashoka the angel. 
we all know that uh, when uh, Ashoka changed his heart and mind, then uh, he was instrumental in um, uh, planting trees all along the uh, roads and different parts of uh, the, uh, the, his kingdom, which was ruled by him. And uh, I will stop here uh, with uh, the slide where I acknowledge the help by my uh, students, uh, my collaborators, Hai Chang, Steve Clemens, David Anderson, Bern Wunemann, and then scientists from Wadi Institute, um, uh, scientists from uh, Inter-University Accelerator Center, New Delhi, and of course, Tara and Peter Cliff for inviting me to deliver this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll allow everyone a moment here to uh, type the questions into the chat um, and then we can go forward with that for the Q&A session. So while people are putting their questions into the chat, I have a quick question. So. Um, I'm, I have a, a kind of personal interest in the history of uh, textiles and things like cotton evolution, because it's kind of a, a drought tolerant crop. And I was wondering if uh, in some of the lakes that you have been reviewing and the evidence that you've been reviewing with these uh, early uh, uh, civilizations, especially in the Indus Valley, if you found any uh, evidence in terms of uh, people moving towards uh, I don't know, different types of, I guess, textiles, um, or uh, maybe if you found evidence uh, regarding that um, in some of your lakes. I know this is a bit of a broad question, but I figured I'd ask anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the cotton is, a, um, is one of the major crops in India. It has been, in fact, it is not now, but it has been the major crops in India. And it was probably domesticated around the early Holocene time, early Holocene time. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but I have actually never uh, uh, thought uh, in that direction. Only thing is on the basis of isotopic values, we have tried to mm -hmm. see whether it was C3 type of vegetation or C4 type of vegetation or camp plants. But uh, we did not look um, in these uh, lake sediments, um, you know, in terms of uh, particular um, uh, seed or particular uh, uh, crop, but uh, uh, maybe in in future we might try to see if. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but so far well, we have not done. Yeah, I, I, basically what I'm getting on with this is be it'd be really interesting to see if there was any like turnover in the types of crops that are utilized with the changing in the monsoon. Um, but again, it's all dependent on you said on the on the resolution and and the and the dating and the chronology. So, um, right. yeah, it's a, yeah. And it's a lot of work. <laughs> Uh, many we, uh, we have a plan to go to Lavrodeva for um, taking out some uh, course and uh, we have a plan to look at those rice, fossilized mm. rice uh, grains and uh, if we have some other grains as well and date them and then see how old are those in fact. So we, nice. we have a plan to go there but, um, uh, but not uh, cotton because uh, uh, that was not our interest in fact. So yeah. But, we might look at. Yeah, great. Oh, we just had a series of questions pop up in the chat. Excellent. Um, no, it, okay. was a, it was a nice talk. And particularly with the history and climate and the, from Himalayas to that peninsular part of India, then have a very good uh, synthesis on whole and give the glimpse of whole of this area. And I really have enjoyed the talk. And your question was very good that we should also see about the cotton and about these things. And it is, of course, I think uh, Professor Gupta and his team will maybe in the future may also like to go in such uh, studies also. Yeah, Thank sure. you so much for having a, such a nice lecture. Thank and you. <laughs> thank you, sir. It was nice to uh, have a, uh, again, have a give us a refreshing our memories. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. So I have a question from uh, Prasenjit, uh, how to, um, uh, you know, this is very difficult uh, exercise to distangle Southwest versus Northeast. Uh, 
Uh, we know uh, when the northeast monsoon was stronger, when the southwest monsoon was strong, stronger. But uh, on the basis of that information, we uh, see that in a particular area where uh, the uh, at present the southwest monsoon uh, controls the precipitation change, we believe that um, uh, that the southwest monsoon was uh, the dominant uh, controlling source of, of moisture in that area. But uh, it is it is not it is not possible to tell uh, that whether this moisture is uh, from except doing some uh, um, ice cores. In fact, in ice cores we can surely find whether it is western disturbance source or it is. But lake sediments um, we have not been able to do that. <clears throat> You have to unmute Tara, you have to unmute your mic. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so there was a, another question about the, from uh, Sana. Uh, did you want to read out your question? Uh, so uh, what they're asking. Uh, is there any signatures of Northeast monsoon in the Indian records uh, during younger dryas and high leak events? Yes, winter precipitation. Uh, yeah, my same answer, in fact. Um, it, it's very difficult to uh, tell because in the uh, Northeast uh, Himalaya, like Meghalaya, we do not have much uh, uh, Western disturbances or, or, or winter moisture source. In fact, most of this winter moisture source uh, comes up to the central part of Himalaya, say Uttarakhand, Himachal. Yeah, we do see in winter time, we have lots of moisture uh, coming uh, from the Central Asian region, uh, brought by uh, Midwesterlies, in fact. But um, Ganga Basin also, you know, these uh, crop patterns, for example, the uh, uh, domestication of uh, wheat and barley and uh, millet, these are uh, basically, uh, these uh, begin their journey as the monsoon, southwest monsoon became weaker, in fact, and we have winter rains. So, um, that winter rains uh, intensification probably led to uh, more uh, winter crops in, in the Ganga Basin as well in, in, in the western part of India, including Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, and Maharashtra. Maybe. Okay, we have a, a hand raised. Uh, Jeet Majumdar, would you like to ask your question? Uh, Jeet, are you there? Um, uh, hello. Hi. <laughs> I think I... Yeah, there, there is one uh, by Sudeep. There is yeah, one yeah. Uh, question that the monsoon... Yes, the monsoon was weak uh, during that time, 1300 to 1700, because this was the uh, transition from the uh, medieval climate anomaly to uh, Little Ice Age. And uh, as we could see, uh, Little Ice Age, the... Uh, uh, the uh, precipitation trend shows more secular trend and uh, it was a weaker air monsoon factor at that time. And we believe probably the cold intervals, the uh, southwest monsoon weakens, which is a general uh, perception in fact. And uh, during Monder minimum, which is a part of, uh, you know, around 1700 AD, the monsoon was weakest uh, uh, during the Monder minimum. So this was also the time when the sun activity was at its... Uh, uh, nadir, in fact, at least. And uh, it is believed that the sun activity probably uh, triggered that change during the monitor minimum in monsoon and other climate systems. Okay. Uh... Rajesh, Rajesh Agnotri, I have a question about how you identify camp, vege vege camp vegetation. We have done on the basis of isotope values of, um, you know, organic matter. We actually analyze what is stable isotope and we know what is the range of C3, what is the range of C4 and what is the range of C uh, camp plant. So on the basis of that only we identified that it was mainly the um, camp uh, type vegetation that was uh, prevalent in a particular time in the Ganga Basin. Uh, let's get to uh, Jeet Majumdar's question. He has his hand raised in the audience, uh, virtual audience here. So Jeet, can you please ask your question? 
there is one more in front line oh, i think it was yes uh ji please continue to some uh, software sub software instances uh, it was by mistake because of the software i guess ah i i understand okay all right thank you <laughs> um then uh, rajiv shana has a question what are your thoughts on picking these signals in the uh, paleo record we have we are analyzing lakes only to see a transition from the fluvial system to lacustrine system when did it happen and how the ecology now we are also focusing our uh, uh, our work to study uh, micro mollusk in very small size mollusk which we are finding Uh, observing in these lakes in fact in uh, especially lakes in west bengal have lots of small gastropods and other mollusks in fact so uh, we are trying to analyze their isotope values and also their population analysis that might tell something about the uh, river rhine versus fluvial uh, versus lacustrine uh, system in the past Okay, great. Um if anybody has any other questions, please please type them in here quickly. Um we've been doing a lovely rapid fire Q&A here. I like it. <laughs> um Yeah, give everybody a moment. Uh thank you Rajesh for answering part of my question. I see in the chat that you uh noted a little bit about cotton. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know we uh, we as we as geologists uh, we owe our responsibility not only to help the archaeologists to social workers to economists and of course climate workers we have uh, lots of role to play in all these fields in fact and uh, it, it is just uh, a question of reorienting your focus uh, uh, that's all and then you can uh, uh retrieve lots of information about uh, whether it is social economic or whether it is related to ecology or agricultural practices or mm -hmm. human activity in a particular area yeah exactly clues from the past are excellent for helping make interpretations right. for the future uh we <laughs> <laughs> so we have one more question here in the chat so from sudeep um asking what will be the next part of research to understand the indian monsoon and is lacking now for understanding the indian summer monsoon that's a big question um, <laughs> so i think maybe uh it's more of what uh maybe what you think your opinion might be on this uh question or topic yeah the um uh, uh, my answer is that the lakes have not been analyzed in full in fact um, everywhere whether it is not only in asia or south asia but also in other parts of the world um and lakes are uh, very important in fact to tell because the uh, their response to the ambient climate change is uh, more rapid or more quick than as compared to the oceans in fact where we get information directly in fact so i would suggest the um uh, the last 2000 years or 2500 500 years is very important in fact to study uh, the uh, changes in these lakes and um, uh, if somebody can do it uh, post 4.2k event because that is the time when most of these lakes appeared in fact so that will be the best uh, you know time slice to understand whether the arid phase really um, led to the because we see lots of lakes that appeared probably post 4.2 k arid event where rivers abandoned their courses and these became oxbow lakes in fact which are now fresh water lakes great thank you uh so i think that we've uh had enough questions for now and we can let you off the hook um so again uh let's thank uh professor gupta here for his lovely talk um and kind of uh producing all of these very interesting i guess uh topics uh that we can think on for the future and again uh i think highlighting kind of this role and responsibility i think many of us scientists have for sharing our information with not just other scientists but with our communities i'm a i'm a big fan of that um and so again uh hands together and so before all of you run away um please remember that we have one more uh 
session of our monsoon seminar series before we kind of take a, uh, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, a bit of a winter holiday break uh, until about mid-January. Um, so please join us next week for Schedule A, where uh, um, Jerome Groenveld, um, again, Schedule A, and we'll send out announcements for that. So again, uh, thank you very much for attending and thank you so much for your talk, um, Professor. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.